Welcome to Introduction to Engineering Design, ENGR 120. For those of you who like your catalog entries, uh, my name is Doug Baxter. I'm a professor at Hudson Valley Community College. And for better or worse, you're stuck with me for the semester, though I think we'll make it work. Let's uh, just spend this week talking a little bit about the course structure and what's expected of you and get things rolling. First of all, I don't think you were expecting to have to do an hour of this course online every week. And for that, I apologize. Uh, what happened was uh, we had some major shuffling of our labs on the main campus down in Troy. And what used to be the uh, metallurgy lab for the uh, manufacturing students got turned into a robotics lab. And they now have to take their metallurgy classes in my mechanical engineering technology metallurgy laboratory, which is fine. But unfortunately, the times they were scheduled for would not work. So we rescheduled the times. And in doing that, we lost the uh, instructor for the lab. So now I have to do it. And that's not, believe me, I enjoy doing it. So I'm happy to do so. But it meant that I couldn't go up uh, to Malta on Tuesdays. That just was not going to work because the only time available was in the early morning on Tuesdays to fit the schedule. So we changed the times, changed the instructor, and as a result, I had to give up the Tuesday uh, Malta. So what we decided to do was to make it three hours on Friday and then just ask you each week to do a little bit online in Blackboard. And the fact that you found this video means you got that far. So well done. And uh, we'll do this first hour, which is not going to be an hour because this video is only about 20 minutes long. Uh, I am not a fan of PowerPoint. Uh, I was taught early on that death by PowerPoint was a very real thing. And so I try to keep these short, sweet to the point, and then the rest of the hour uh, that you're doing is kind of like a homework assignment. I'm going to treat it as such. So doing this assignment counts it towards your homework. So there you go. You are earning points even before we first meet. I'm going to ask each week that you view the video and any course material that I put there for you prior to Friday's class. So when we get together Friday, we'll take about an hour and chat, and then we can spend the last two hours doing uh, some exercises uh, in the design process arena. So I hope that you'll enjoy that. Should be a lot of fun. Well, what are our course goals, right? You need to have goals in the course. Um, it's not random. Well, the first is to understand the engineering design process. Not quite as easy as it sounds because there is no one engineering design process. There's a basic school of thought, or actually schools of thought. And we'll be going over some of those on Friday. But in the end, you need to have a sort of a feel for how the process generically works. And we're going to do that by practicing it. Now, and I, I put within the scope of your knowledge. Why do I say that? Uh, you're young and just starting out in your career on this. And as such, I can't ask you to do advanced mathematics or analysis or, you know, ask you to do, you know, hundreds of pages of detailed drawings or that sort of thing that is entailed in real design. We just can't do that in a 15-week environment. And again, you just don't have the background to do that. You will if you pursue an engineering degree, but uh, not for a few years. And as such, we're going to you know, try to show you the process within what you already know how to do and yet broaden your horizons just a bit. We'll use the tools used in the engineering design process, and these are some of the brainstorming tools, process management tools, and the engineering notebook. And I'll be explaining these uh, during the Friday lecture over the next two weeks. So don't worry, I'm deliberately keeping it short and sweet uh, in this video. I'm going to ask you to create uh, some small designs via the, the design project. And uh, that there's going to be three of those. They'll be just a couple weeks long each. And the idea is, is kind of just to, you as a team to develop, build some team working skills, and be able to present those projects uh, to the rest of the class. Grading, well, you know, 
there isn't a student alive that doesn't want to know how their grades work. So what we're going to do is use a straight 90-80-70 scale. Uh, that's HVCC and, in fact, SUNY policy. So we'll stick to that, right? And you're probably used to seeing that anyway. So, but that's going to break up a bit like this. Now, this is not exact. Um, you know, it says up to, because if you add these up, you get 110%. So, obviously, uh, you know, there's going to be a little bit of changing here. Uh, the exam is probably going to be worth 25%. Uh, and the final project may be worth 20%. I think that would be, that would get us to 100, and I think we'll leave it at that. But uh, you'll notice that right at the top is class participation at 10%. You cannot get an A in this class unless you participate. And participating does not mean just showing up. Showing up's important because you lose points if you don't, um, you know, short of minor inconveniences like death, particularly your own. But, uh, you know, other than that, we got to, you know, we're expected to be there unless the excuse is really, really good. Uh, you know, at a company, you can't just leave. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Yes, things happen. You know, I understand that. But, you know, get in the habit of you need to tell us ahead of time, hey, I can't be there. Uh, you know, you need to step up and take that uh, responsibility. Um, the in-class assignments and your participation. You know, if you're sitting in your seat, but you're staring at your phone, checking out the latest TikTok, uh, that is not participating. And uh, yours truly will note that and be less than thrilled. So uh, let's try to make that not happen. Um, homework, watching these hourly videos, that's going to be 20% of your grade. I think that's worthwhile, uh, get you to do that. We'll do 20% on projects, uh, the three projects. Uh, will be each report, yeah, design report will be required for each project. So engineering writing is a big part of this. And, uh, I would really like, if time permits, to have you present each project, uh, orally as well. Because engineers do, despite what you've heard out there, we do talk to each other at times. And remember, engineers are selling their ideas to the company and asking the company to invest time and effort into building the product the way you envision it to be built, um, you need to have communication skills. And often you're talking to people who are not engineers. So you can't talk a bunch of symbols and mathematics at them. They don't have that background. You're talking to accountants and salespeople, and you've got to convince them that you know what you're doing and you're going to give them the right thing that they can do their work on. You know, the sales engineer, you want to make it as easy for them to sell that product as you can. And for that management team, you want to make them look as good as possible. Um, that's how we do it. Three exams overall over the semester. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at the syllabus online. I'll be tracking that, see you saw it. So we'll track that. Uh, and you can see that we've got three of them scheduled roughly weeks uh, 4, 8, and 12. So um, I think that's kind of where I put them. Um, the way we'll do the exams, they will be on the Friday. Uh, we meet for three hours, so we'll cut lab short. And after the second hour, we'll spend the final hour doing the exam. So that'll um, force you to finish it in an hour because you're going to have to go get on the bus. So I took care of that problem. And uh, that's how we'll do that. The final project, which will be 20%, not 25 um, will uh, include a design report, the oral presentation, not may include, it will. Uh, I pulled this uh, from previous semesters. Um, this is the first time I've been teaching this class here. I taught it at RPI, and I, uh, I'm i going to use the RPI model because, frankly, I think you're up to it, and I think you're going to do just fine with it. So that's what we're going to do. And this takes the place of a formal final exam. So there is no final exam. There is a final project. And then there's three hourly exams. I would almost call them quizzes, uh, but call them what you will. So there's the grading nuts and bolts. Look at the syllabus on Blackboard. That'll fill in the details. Please do that for me before Friday. How about a little bit about me? Now, you notice I don't have the video turned on. You're welcome. Uh, I'll see you Friday, so I don't think that's a big deal. And frankly, I just want to get the size of this down nice and easy. Uh, 
put it on the YouTube channel and just let you watch it. But here we go. Um, I've been a mechanical engineer since 1983. Uh, I did that by graduating from Syracuse University and then later uh, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So um, I've got two different schools under my belt for this whole engineering thing. As an engineer uh, or as an engineering student, I've done a fair amount of stuff. Uh, uh, all the places I worked at, I can say I learned a lot, and each job better prepared me for the next one. Um, during college, I worked for Great Lakes Towing Company in Cleveland. Uh, that's where I grew up. And I was there one summer, and I worked in the shipyard. And I wasn't engineering. I was working as a, as a dockyard worker. I did a lot of painting. Oh, dear God, did I paint. Uh, but I also helped out in the machine shop, engine rebuilds, uh, worked, uh, did a little welding, got to drive the forklift around. That was fun. Uh, and I did whatever I was told. And it was interesting work. And you really see how engineering works at that level because you're dealing with it on a, a very personal you know, at the low level. Uh, I spent the next two summers uh, with Dunbar and Sullivan, a marine construction company, actually out of Wisconsin, but they had a Cleveland office for doing work on Lake Erie. And they, uh, the first summer, uh, we dredged the Rocky River uh, back to its proper depth, along with the Corps of Engineers. That was a fascinating job. And I worked in the field office as a surveyor and doing calculations. And then the second summer, uh, I was the so-called engineer in charge on the on the day shift for a, uh, we were putting in a water intake plant. Believe it or not, they do drink the Lake Erie water around there. And if you process it, it won't kill you. Um, so there you go. But uh, I, I did that, and I did the day shift, which was from uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then there was a night shift engineer because we worked 24 hours a day, six days a week because you had very limited time uh, working on the lake. And several days you couldn't work because the weather was bad. So uh, it was a great way to pay for college because there was lots of overtime. And uh, you had no social life, but you got a lot of work done. And uh, it was fascinating. I was out on the rig, and I was also working in uh, surveying uh, making sure that the pipe depth was proper as we were placing it and uh, doing all the calculation work for that and shooting uh, the getting the depth measurements and shooting the uh, transit to make sure we were in the right place, digging the line and everything else. So very interesting work. Uh, from there, I went to IBM after graduating from Syracuse, uh, worked in several different pieces. If you look at the uh, one assignment to do your on the discussion board and blackboard you'll see my full bio there and you're more than invited to read that and get all the gory details um after leaving ibm i went to work at rensselaer polytechnic institute ibm kind of imploded in 1993 and they my job turned into a paperwork job which i, I just didn't really like i mean it was nice that they kept me i appreciated that but rpi whom I'd done a lot of work with uh, because I was in charge of several research projects we were doing there, uh, called me up and they asked to lure me away in a teaching gig, which I did. And eventually I wound up as the uh, associate dean of technology. And that was a fascinating job. I really enjoyed that. Uh, had a good time, did that through 2006 and then decided to go into consulting. I uh, went to a work for a company called CAD Dimensions. I not only consulted, I worked with the sales force uh, demoing the product. We sold SolidWorks uh, and Stratus 3D printers. It was kind of really interesting work. Um, I also, you know, just helped out with training and, you know, taking customer phone calls, that sort of thing. And, uh, and I, but I also worked mainly as an internal consultant. And I did several fascinating uh, pieces of analysis while I was there. And I had every intention of staying there. It was a very nice job, but I got lured away uh, uh, to come to Hudson Valley and the lure of running a department was just too good. And so I uh, come and I now 
in charge of the curriculum at uh, the mechanical engineering technology program. Not the engineering science program that you're in, uh, which is a sister part of our department, but I, I, I own the curriculum for the uh, mechanical engineering technology, and I really enjoy it. So, And here I am still to this day, and I will retire out of this job, I promise. So that is going to happen. Okay. What is engineering design? Well, we're going to be spending the next two weeks talking about this, but I want to give you at least a flavor and some thoughts to roll around in your head uh, as you come to class on Friday. Wikipedia, doesn't it always have a definition for everything? Uh, this is there. I like this. The design process generates a conceptual solution. It does more than that. For a problem stated in the form of requirements. That's true. And then they give a bunch of double E exa and software examples because it's Wikipedia. But um, that's okay. It works for mechanical too. So the key thing here is it, pre it presents a solution. And it's not just a conceptual solution. It, I really would argue that's limiting. It presents the entire solution. Uh, and it's based upon requirements. What is it we're trying to do? We're at point A right now in the universe. How do we move to point B? How do we make something bigger, better, faster? Or in those rare, wonderful instances, how do we create something totally brand new that never existed before? <laughs> Design process is a way of figuring out what you need to do, then go doing it. I like that. You might have to solve one or more problems along the way. That's often true. There are design challenges. You're trying to achieve a goal. You're doing something. And I would add here that what's missing in this, in the engineering design process, is that you then need to go sell it. Right? Because if nobody likes what you came up with as a solution and nobody buys it, uh, it probably wasn't the right thing to doing. That probably means back here you got the requirements wrong. You know, designing something, and we'll talk about this Friday, there have been some classic blunders out there where uh, companies have come up with a product based upon false requirements. And as a result, even though the product itself was well-engineered, you know, well-designed, nobody wanted it. And that's kind of embarrassing. Uh it's not necessarily about working the right way or wrong way. There's a lot of ways to work. And I like that part of the definition, too. However, I would point out that if other companies can do what you do faster, more efficiently, and get to market quicker, you won't be doing a design process anymore. You'll be doing something called bankruptcy. So you do need to be able to do it in a timely manner. And then I added this definition on design thinking that it's nonlinear. It's an iterative process. You ask yourself a lot of questions, and the team asks itself a lot of questions and tries to create answers. And those answers require research. They may require some lab testing. And you challenge assumptions. You know, you, we've done it this way in the past. Do we need to continue doing it in the future? Often, yes. But sometimes, no. Sometimes we find a smarter way. However, whenever we break an assumption, you know, a, you know, a basic assumption, there may be legal ramifications. There may be social ramifications. And we'll be talking about some of those on Friday, too. I'm going to give you some fun examples from out there in the, in the field. Here's just a approach to engineering design. Um, I have several books on engineering design I've collected over the years. And some talk about the five-step process, and the six-step process, and the seven-step process. And um, I'm not so sure if I'm reading an engineering book or something written by Arthur Murray. And I'm guessing all of you are too young to get that gag, but uh, I'm going to leave it there anyway. Ask your folks, they'll be able to tell you. But, you know, it's not about the number of steps, okay? Because this one shows eight steps. So here we go. And... You'll notice what it does here. This is just kind of a generic flow. You start by defining the problem. That is a lot harder than it sounds. What is it you're really trying to do? 
you do some background research. What's out there? What's close? What can we start with and then maybe just improve to get to what we need? Or do we need to slam a couple different things together to come up with this new thing? You know, here's a design that does 20% of what I need. Here's one that does another 20%. And can I kind of merge them together to get 40% of what I need or maybe more? We do that all the time. We specify the requirements. How big does it need to be? How much power does it consume? What, you know, is it something we plug in? Do we use batteries? Do we, you know, feed it coal to make it go? What do we do? Um, we need to understand that. And then we brainstorm. We sit down and we think about it. We don't just jump in with both hands and feet. We come up with multiple solutions and then we do some testing. We, we, you know, either with software or hardware testing, whatever we need to do. And then we get together and we come up with what we think are going to be good designs. And we may come up with two or three solutions. And then we share it with the team. You know, we ask sales to look at it. We ask manufacturing to look at it. We ask everybody to look at it. We ask the accountants to look at it. We never like to, but we do. And we do all those things. And then we come up with a solution. We test that solution in a variety of ways, software and hardware wise. And if we met everything that we thought we did, and we more or less got the requirements in the order that we wanted them, because some requirements are more important than others, then, well, yeah, we communicate the results, or more importantly, we can go build it. We can order parts, we can start building, we can ship product. But we may need to loop in here, because we may find as we develop stuff, we run into problems we did not anticipate, we didn't define the problem properly, and we got to go back and do it again. So, you know, one of the things that engineering design is meant to do is not to catch major problems down here while we're testing. All the major problems get caught up here in the beginning of the design process. So we don't do that to ourselves. And that's what we'll be talking about, how we try to do that. And there are tools that help us do it. I mean, yes, experience, nothing beats it. But you have to get that experience, and that's part of what this class does, is to give you that initial experience. No one approach is correct. There's a lot of ways to do this. When I was at IBM, we had a very tight design process. And I'll talk about that in a minute. When I was at CAD Dimensions, our design process, because, because we were selling, that was the main part of our design, I was doing some consulting work where I'm designing per se, it was a much more open process and required much less documentation. You know, at IBM, we had what was called the Red Book, and this thing was several hundred pages long. Thankfully, by the time I showed up, they were they had put the thing online so I could read it on the computer. Uh, but it handled everything from the conception all the way past this flowchart into actually shipping the product. And to give you an idea how, of how detailed that process was, when I designed a part, um, and I did a lot of cooling design, I was in heat transfer, so say I designed a piece of sheet metal to, as a piece of ductwork in a computer. In addition to my signature, it required 35 signatures to get that part to the point where someone could order it from manufacturing or a decision had been made in-house that we were going to order stock sheet metal and build it ourselves. We very rarely did that. But we, it took 35 signatures. And if anything went wrong with that process, they went right back to signature number one, which was mine. And that's how we did it. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it was a very detailed process. And I'm not going to go through it all with you, of course. But just to show you that, you know, companies take this incredibly seriously because if you miss it can be disastrous when you log into blackboard with your hudson valley account come down find the our course uh engr 12860 that's the section number which means hybrid you'll come to this announcement page you'll see a little logo there'll be more in here by the time you log in uh, but i want you to go to the uh, course information Look over the syllabus, look over the notebook, and maybe if you want to see where, when you can get a hold of me, you can look at my schedule as well. I then want you to go to the uh, weekly modules, look at the first week, 
which will have this video uh, and the PowerPoint itself. And you don't need to worry about the handouts, but you're certainly welcome to go there. And then the discussion board, this is where you can just go in and uh, if you click on this uh, introductions, you can um, create a post and uh, make sure you can do that just by clicking on it here. You can click on it and you can see right now there's my biography. So you go ahead and click on that and uh, add a thread. So um, create thread button up here. And if you could do that for me by Friday, that would be awesome. And not only will I thank you for that, I'll give you some points. How's that? Even better, right? Because, hey, that's what it's about. All right. What would I like you to do prior to our first class on Friday? I would like you to provide a brief introduction of yourself in that discussion section of Blackboard. Read over the syllabus and bring any questions you have to class Friday. Nice and easy. Not asking a lot this week, but asking just a little bit to get you used to Blackboard. Once again, welcome to the class. Looking forward to seeing you all on Friday. Uh, I will see you then, and I hope we all have a good time.